All right, folks, the time has finally come to tackle evolution and species diversification. I thought since I have a channel devoted to arthropod animals, and arthropods happen to be the most diverse phylum in the animal kingdom, this topic seemed quite fitting. In front of you, you'll find members of the class Insecta, otherwise known as the most diverse class of animals in the world, and probably in the history of life on this planet. But how did that happen? Obviously these animals evolved and diversified, but what was it that gave them the edge over all other animal groups? Some of the reasons for this are absolute nonsense, so you're going to want to strap in for this one. Let's start by going over how evolution actually works. I think a lot of people imagine that this is simply the process of one animal becoming an objectively better animal over a long period of time. But while that may be true in a vacuum, the real process is far more nuanced. See, whether or not an animal evolves into a better form is completely dependent on the environment that it lives in. Oftentimes, this type of change mirrors a rearranging of stats rather than a gross increase. Just like, say, different vehicles in a game like Mario Kart can favor different players' racing styles, different animal adaptations can favor survival rates in certain environments. Now, since animals have existed for millions of years, and they've seen a lot of changes in environments, sets of adaptations that were once perfect for survival can become inferior, as the setting changes around them. But, because insects have such fast life cycles and reproduction rates, they're able to mutate and adapt at a faster rate than other animals. This, combined with several other adaptations unique to insects, made them one, the most diverse faction of animals of all time. Now, in order to explore the lateral nature of evolution, I want to first talk about one of the insect's most powerful adaptations, flight. While flight is not unique to insects, it was at one point, and it remained that way for around 100 million years. Even today, flight remains one of nature's rarest adaptations. The fossil record suggests flight has only evolved four times in the animal kingdom. Once in insects, once in pterosaurs, once in birds, and once in bats. Take a look at the four lineages here. Do you notice anything about the insect that is different from the other three? More specifically, anything interesting about the number of limbs? The three vertebrate lineages, they have two limbs, unless you count the ones that modified into wings. The insects have six limbs on top of the additional wings. Not, not only that, they don't have a pair of wings, they have two pairs of wings, which makes for a total of four, and it costs them none of their legs. Insects growing wings from seemingly out of nowhere has baffled scientists for a long time. The current consensus is that they came from ancient gill-like structures, but that sounds like a stretch compared to simple modified limbs like invertebrates. Well, better believe insects have put those wings to good use. This is a dragonfly from the order Odonata. It's an ancient lineage of insects that practically looks identical to how it did 350 million years ago during the Carboniferous period. There's a reason this body plan persisted. Dragonflies are up there with some of the most efficient predators in the world, boasting success rates of around 95 to 97%. They achieve this by simply outmaneuvering everything else in the air. Because their wings are controlled by independent muscles, which is rare among insects, they can actually move their wings in separate directions. And by doing this, this essentially gives them different gears of flight, and it grants abilities like hovering, fast acceleration, fast lift generation, sideways and backward movements, and also sharp turns. But not every insect uses the same body model. Beetles are one of the most diverse orders of animals in the world. Scientists have discovered over 400,000 beetle species. Their evolution took a very different turn than that of the dragonflies. I imagine the beetle ancestor said, hey, you know those four wings we literally pulled out of thin air? Turns out, you only need two of them to fly. So somewhere along the line, the first two pairs of wings stopped being used for flight and started acting like a shield for their more delicate flying wings while they weren't in use. These shield-like front wings are called elytra. I like to think of insects as monopoly players that somehow started with double the cash of all the other players. They can get away with crazy stuff like this. Now, the scientific name for the order of beetles is Coleoptera, which means sheathed wings, which is a pretty fitting name for such a successful group of animals. Pound for pound, they are the sturdiest of all flying animals, since they can shrug off attacks from large predators that would have devastated the delicate wings of a different animal, and it's all thanks to these elytra. 
A 2013 paper titled Biomechanical Basis of Wing and Hull Tear Coordination in Flies listed two adaptations that were critical to insect diversification. The first was flight, and the second was miniaturization of their body size. I think this is a great point. A lot of important decomposition and nutrient recycling processes are done by microorganisms like mites, fungi, and bacteria. But if some of those organisms could fly, they would be able to spread across biomes much easier. And wouldn't you know it, insect wing evolution played a big role in miniaturization as well. Take a look at this bee. Notice anything interesting about it? Well, surprise! That's not a bee. It's a true fly from the order Diptera. It's trying to look like a bee to deter potential predators. But how can we tell it's a fly? There are a few clues, like the large surface area that the eyes take up, but the dead giveaway here is that the animal only has two wings. W what happened to the other two? Well, they were modified into this. Well, hold on a sec, let's zoom in. Yes, these things. They're called haltiers, and just like the elytra in the beetles, these haltiers don't help the animal fly, but they do help flies remain stable while in the air. I'm not very good with physics, so the simple explanation is that the haltiers act like gyroscopes that vibrate and correct the fly's position in the air by providing extremely fast information to the flight muscles. They achieve this through the Coriolis effect, but the actual mathematics don't make any sense to me. In any case, flies get it, and that's what really matters here. Believe it or not, these haltiers really help flies, because the smaller an animal is, the faster its wings have to beat to stay airborne. Dipterans can be really small. Like, for example, what we see in fruit flies and gnats, the rapid wing movement could really destabilize an animal if it barely weighs anything. So the haltiers make sure that the animal can fly without completely spinning out of control all the time. Part of why I love looking at insect wings is that they're such a good example of an adaptation that didn't evolve in the traditional sense of something good becoming better, but rather it evolved sideways. All of these wing models, they still exist today and they're wildly successful. It's not a replacement of traits that made insects the most successful group of animals, it's the variety of those traits that truly gives them the edge. Now, I don't have the heart to finish this video without touching on my favorite group of animals, the arachnids. If you ever called a spider an insect, you may have been corrected by someone who tells you, um, actually, they're arachnids. But why does that matter? To the average person, it probably won't make a difference. But believe it or not, the lineages of insects and arachnids split from each other well over 400 million years ago, and the effect of that split can still be felt today. For example, the arachnid ancestor didn't have wings or antennae, therefore no living arachnid has wings or antennae. It's a lot harder to suddenly grow body parts that your ancestors didn't have, which is why all adult insects still have exactly six legs, despite there being millions of different species. This of course makes it all the more baffling that insects suddenly showed up with four wings one day, but let's not be the dead horse here. I have a question. How many appendages do spiders have? If you answered eight, you would be correct if the question had asked about legs. Arachnids have ten appendages. They have eight legs, and they have two pedipalps. In spiders, the pedipalps are small, but they're more pronounced in the mygalomorph lineage, which is why some people confuse tarantula pedipalps with legs sometimes. Pedipalps serve different purposes in different arachnids. Now, with this knowledge, we can reasonably assume that the arachnid common ancestor had eight legs and two pedipalps. But when the extant arachnid groups diverged from that common ancestor, they seem to have had different plans for those ten appendages. Check out this guy. Scorpions are probably the second most famous arachnid. Do they share the same appendages as their spider cousins? They sure do. Here we see four legs on each side, adding up to eight, as well as two pedipalps. Unlike spiders, scorpions don't have silk or fangs to hold down prey, so their pedipalps evolved into claws to help them hold on to their meals while they wait for their venom to act. And for those of you wondering, a scorpion's tail isn't considered a new appendage, but rather it's an extension of the abdomen segments. Okay, okay, last example. Here is a member of a different arachnid order called Amblypigi. They're freaky looking creatures for sure, but they're totally harmless. Amblypigids are nocturnal and or cave dwelling animals. So while their eyesight is bad, they have other sensory organs to help them detect predators and prey in the dark. Remember those antennae that insects have on their heads, but arachnids are missing? Yeah, those would sure come in handy right about now. 
Fear not. While arachnids don't have antennae to sense with, they do have more legs than they know what to do with. So, the amblypigid lineage simply modified their first two pairs of legs into sensory organs covered in tiny sensitive hairs. These legs can pick up vibrations and scents, and they're much longer than the six walking legs, so the animal can actually probe an area from far away before moving into it. These whip-like sensory legs are why amblypigids are often called whip spiders or tailless whip scorpions. Bonus fact, as if these guys weren't creepy enough, their pedipalps are also modified into grasping appendages lined with sharp spikes. Just like with scorpions, these claws make sure their prey can't get away. Anyway, all of this is to say that, once again, arachnids are showing the lateral nature of evolution, in terms of related animals modifying homologous body parts over time, repurposing them to fit their current needs. And honestly, the world is better for it because it means that there is that much more diversity to appreciate in the animal kingdom. Thank you all for watching. I know my rate of video production is slowing, but that's because my standards are going up. I appreciate everyone's patience as you watch me slowly start to distance myself from the title of the world's worst video editor, and I deeply appreciate everyone who gave feedback on how my videos can improve. There is more arthropod-related content coming your way for sure, and I hope you'll bear with me as I slowly better this channel's quality. As for now, this is Daniel Orion signing off. I will catch you all in the next one. Peace.